Future Hacker. Life. Path. Future. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Future Hacker. I'm your host, Maria Taigi, and today we are talking to Ryan Robinson. Ryan is the world's first quantum engineer, the founder of Conduit and a TEDx speaker. He's a visionary who is creating quantum technology to change the world. He's helping create new medication and tests for COVID-19 to stop the pandemic. Ryan went to MIT when he began researching dark matter at the age of 18. Can you believe that? So he also created Conduit when he was still a student and graduated at MIT with three majors, Mechatronics, International Humanities, and Quantum Engineer. So this is a super interesting background, uh, Ryan. At the age of 22, Ryan was featured in Forbes for Conduit's work in solving real-world problems. And there's so much more about him, you know, not to mention he's also a poet, a jazz saxophonist. Ryan, it's amazing to have you with us today. You're a truth future hacker. So how are you doing? Great. I'm so excited to be here. I'm really, really excited to be here. So thank you so much, Maria, and everyone else on the team. You know what? I think that a good beginning is just tell, a, tell us about yourself. You know, what was that in your life? drove you to be researching dark matter at the age of 18 and so young to open a company with the goal of using quantum technology for good while studying, right? right? What was it that happened that changed your life? And is there any source or is it just the way you are? Honestly, it's just, it's just in my DNA. Um, I just came out the womb and I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to do things that change the world, um, that are big, that are new, um, that are historic. You know, and I think part of that, probably if I you know, explained it from my family background, I would say that um, I have a lot of theater people in my background and my mom's side, dad's side. And so for me, I see history as a stage, you know, uh, you're sort of a performer on history stage, um, you know, Lincoln and all those type of people, Alexander the Great, the sense of being on history stage. So when I was a theater kid growing up, so for me, like the biggest stage is, is, is history, you know, all, all of sort of human existence. So there, there's that. And then too, from the sort of entrepreneurial side is that I have a lot of entrepreneurs in my family on both sides again. So um, for instance, my father, Rodney Robinson, he had his own law practice in Miami, really well known. You know, he was in magazines too in his own time and everything, had cases on TV. Um, to this day, he has judges and lawyers that even he fought against in the courtroom that still remember him fondly. Um, and then he actually was able to afford law school because his grandfather, so my great grandfather, um, he actually, my great grandfather was a landscaper in South Beach back at a time where you could not be a person of color on South Beach, um, which is totally different how it is now. And so he was this uh, Bahamian immigrant from the Bahamas. And he would landscape for one of, one of these people was an artist. It was an artist that he landscaped for. He did his, his, his lawn for. And um, he did it so well, you know, even though it's kind of a lawn, that the, the owner of the house, the artist, said, okay, well, I'll pay for your grandson, my dad, Rodney, uh, his, 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 all his schooling. All his schooling. And so that, you know, triggered from there. So I'm, I'm a direct uh, beneficiary of that, you know, uh, act of goodness. That, that's really interesting story and amazing how generations can impact uh, further yeah. down, right? Uh, so let's jump into, you know, when you find that conduit. So if I'm not wrong, you started the business with a goal which uh, was then pivoted as the world changed, right? So by then, it aimed to gather underused or unused computa computational capacity from your device and share it with, with others who need to perform computationally intensive calculations, such as crunching through large data sets. Could you just walk us through that, you know, from the day it was created to where, where we stop now, right? Yeah, absolutely. I know that was a mouthful. So yeah. basically, simple guys who, you know, who, some of those words might have scared you a little bit. What we did is we made the Airbnb of computers, the Airbnb of computers. So again, you have an extra house, you have Maybe you have a bunch of real estate, whatever, then you can rent it out, right? To someone that needs it, someone that wants to use it. So same basic idea here is you got all this computer space on your phone. We actually don't use a lot of our um, computer brain power, just like we don't use sometimes a lot of all of our, our brain power. <laughs> and so it's okay, well, maybe someone else can use that, right? Like the scientists working on, you know, a, a cure for HIV um, to the um, biologists, to whatever you want to say. I mean, there's a huge need for computing power. So you have it where basically you have these two 
um, left hand, right hand. On the left hand, you know, all of us with our phones and we're watching TikTok and all that stuff. We're not really using all the the computing power um, that our phones have. That's dramatically more powerful than it was, you know, as anyone can tell you that's lived long enough than it was 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, like from the 80s and 90s when there were the big blocks, you know, it's like, oh my God, I have my cell phone. So it's to much more powerful than that. Uh, to give you an idea is that the phones now, I mean, are about, a, I want to say around a thousand to a million times more powerful than the, all the computing power NASA used to launch a man on the moon. So keeping that in mind, it's like, okay, wow, there's some untapped power here. And then again, the opposite side of it, um, there's a huge need for computing power on the R&D side, biology side, anything that's the cutting edge is, is very computer heavy now. It's not so much of kind of like the Leonardo da Vinci, you know, working in his in his studio. Now it's teams of people, teams of computers, very resource intensive. And so naturally me being at MIT, you know, it made a lot of sense. But funny enough, it, you know, it's, it's pretty crazy. I always wanted to be an inventor as a kid. Always, always wanted to be an inventor as a kid. That was like what I wanted to do and make my own business doing it. And so funny enough, I, I, I remember going back home after I invented Conduit, after I thought of con conceptualized Conduit. And when I went back, um, to back home to Miami, I'm from Miami, born and raised in Miami. Uh, shout out to 305. And my dad had my inventor's notebook. He said, hey, son, remember your inventor's notebook when you were a kid? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That. You know, it's like this sort of old thrown away thing, all raggedy and everything. And, and, it, and it falls on the floor, right? And, and it opens up to this page. I pick it up, opens up to this page. And it was me when I was eight years old drawing this computer network that would channel power, you know? So really, really cool. So in that way, I feel like in some way I was I was destined to, to do something like Conduit. And so I'm really grateful for that. And now with kind of going from that version of it, that version of it and that phase of it to where we are now with NanoSplash and the medical tests and everything for research, the way that happened was very, very straightforward. Um, is we just said, okay, well, we have this computing power, like I was saying, how can we use it to help people? That's all it was. And there are all these different avenues, right? So you can, use, you can use computers for so many different things, of course, even at a high level. So one example is like Pixar, uh, movies, animation, right? That's one example. A lot of computing power. Two, second example would be finance. That's pretty straightforward. Calculations, betting, gambling, da, da, da. Then three is biology. That's why I keep kind of using biology over, over and over again. Is it, it's, it's, it's to give you an idea, a scientist told me, he said that drug discovery is the most complicated thing humans are doing today. And I said, okay, well, that's, you know, computers, that makes sense for us to do. And so we dived into that space and looked at how can we do drug discovery, especially keep in mind, again, my, part of my background, like Maria said, is in quantum, quantum physics, quantum engineering. So I'm the world's first quantum engineer, quantum engineer. A little trivia for guys out there is that the inventor, the creator of the quantum computing idea is Richard Feynman, really the most notable one. Um, and now was, he's an MIT alum. He did it in, in 1980, 81. So very much falls into that MIT lineage, you know, and there's a lot of MIT luminaries uh, there that are in the quantum computing space, like uh, Seth Lloyd um, and people like that. Scott Aronson, he just recently left. So bring it back is that, okay, Drug discovery, making drugs needs a lot of computers. Gotcha. Quantum computers also can help with that. So it just it was a very much so an alignment of what we can do, what we can offer uniquely, and how we can help people. That was all. That's what it's all about. You know, that's what it's all about. So for me, I feel like if you have gifts in this world, you know, you gotta you gotta share them, you gotta use them because we, we all benefit so much. You know, we're using computers right now. Someone worked on that, and they slaved over that, and then someone improved on it and improved on it. So we benefit when people share their gifts with us, obviously. And so then fast forward now, so we went from Airbnb of computing power. Okay, gotcha. Two, let's use that computing power for drug discovery. Two. Then three was okay. Now, specifically with the COVID pandemic 2020, um, what happened was is that we were actually invited to work with the White House uh, in April of 2020. And it was wild, it was a wild experience. And so it was it was me and my my team at Conduit, uh, led by Logan Thrasher Collins, great guy. I would strongly recommend all you guys look him up, Logan Thrasher Collins. And we literally came up with this way to find treatments for not just COVID-19, not just COVID-19, but future coronaviruses. So say in 20 years, you know, there's COVID-21, whatever you want to say, or a big, another outbreak. We can kind of be those guys you knock on the door of, you know, and it's time to change the world again. And that's published research. It's out there in the world. And, and we did it. And it was alongside not just the White House, but Amazon, Google, Microsoft and us. And it was really, really amazing.
Wow, that's really, I can't imagine that. Okay, so, and, so just what, what you said here, that's, it just opens so many doors to so many questions right now. Okay, so let's go, let's go step by step, right? Uh, okay, so 2020, let's go back to 2020, right? You work with the White House, right? To find this cure. So can, can you just share with us a little bit more of this experience and how was it? Like, how was it working with the White House for such a huge cause and, you know, it was... So there's a few different things going on. This is going to set the the, the, the the preface for, so hang with me a little bit, is that, so one, here's what's going on. So one is conduit side of things is that, and first I'll say it's really crazy because your failures really lead to your best successes. So it was, or failures. And so it was 2018 and, um, and we got uh, an, an investment. And long story short, I think Maria was telling about this before, you know, they basically, with money, sometimes guys, it comes with strings attached, you know, and so these investors are basically like the worst kind of investor you kind of can imagine. I mean, it's very unethical. They wanted us to violate this securities law and do that and expose this. And I think they're even hitting on one of our team members at some point. And they want us to hire some lady out in Singapore and pay like $20,000 a, a week for managing a chat. It was like, whoa, like, what are you talking? It was all this crazy stuff. Um, and they, they sent us a, excuse my language, Maria, but they sent, me, sent us a, a fuck you rap. Um, they said, I don't care about you. Uh, fuck you. I want my money too. Like something like that. It was like really crazy. And he, sent, he sent it to the whole team and it was wild. And it was like, what? It was just, this dude was off the chain. And fortunately that company doesn't exist anymore. Um, and so, you know, obviously we had to say no, no to the money. And, um, and we had to say no to the money. And it was brutal. I mean, painful. You know, I mean, I had this like uh, this uh, Back Bay apartment. For those who aren't familiar with Boston, Back Bay is a really nice area. It's probably the nicest uh, area, and it was right across from MIT. And so I had to give up my apartment. I was like, oh man, no. And and um, and even my girlfriend left me at the time. It was terrible. It was just like the worst. And uh, I had and I had advisors, and I said, listen, you know, we're this is gonna be a huge event. You know, if you guys want to, do you guys want to stay on? Do you want to stay off? And I just told him the whole story. I said, here's where, here's where we're at. Here's what's happened. Here's what's going on. Do you want to stay with me? And if it's okay, it's totally okay if you want to leave. And I had one advisor named Jonathan Asbury, Jonathan Asbury and, um, older British guy, funny enough. And, and no, he's like, I really believe in you guys. And I totally understand. And you guys are doing really good work, you know? And, and so I want to encourage that and support that. And so fast forward, he's going to come in more of the story in a second, but Fast forward is that um, when we would travel across the world speaking, a lot of people would have this sense to say, Ryan, I feel like Conduit you, Conduit is, is going to really change the world one day. This is prior to the White House work. I'm talking 2017, 2018, right out, right out of MIT, um, green faced, you know, didn't know what was going on, how to do a conference, all that type of stuff. And Jonathan, for him, he had a, a brother pass away from cancer. And so he asked me, he promised me, asked me to promise to work on a treatment one day. Um, and I said, yeah, I can absolutely, I can absolutely do that. And this was in 2018. I was like in my grandma's like living room on my phone, you know, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. And I was serious about it, but you know, it was just like it's sort of a random casual context. And um, so then I said, okay. So then what happens, so that's one story. So then two before, so it's 2018, I'm having to give up the apartment. I have one last hurrah. And I invite all my MIT friends and their friends to come and, and hang out. Everyone kind of in the Boston area. And um, and so we have like 40 people, 50 people show up. And we're all just having fun, having a good time. And uh, playing board games, whatever. And this one guy walks in. I mean, he was maybe five feet tall. Looked like he was 16. I was like, I don't, I feel like I had to ID him. Walking into my own apartment. I was like, are you, sir, are you allowed to be here? And... Um, he walks in, doesn't say hi to anybody. He just walks in and he sits on the couch and he, he, he goes and grabs a nanotechnology book from my library. I had all, of course, I have a nanotechnology book <laughs> coming from MIT, of course, uh, casual. And so he grabs a huge, thick nanotechnology book, textbook that's on the highest shelf, by the way. So we had to like go and reach for it. And he's sitting on the, on this couch, this futon, reading about nanotechnology. And again, everyone else is totally far away, having fun, partying. It's like, what? And so I go over to talk to him um, as the host, of course, and I introduce myself. And he's just kind of looking at me, kind of sizing me up. He's okay. He says, I'm like, you'll, you'll do, you know, you'll, you'll work. So I reach out to him and say, hey, just want to connect with you, let you know I'm, I'm here, you're here, maybe let's work together in the future. And his name was Logan. His name was Logan. 
And so, yeah, yeah, okay, great. Nice to meet you. Cool, moving on. And so fast forward, now the, so getting toward the end of the story, is that we do a conference at the end of 2019. Um, so you've got Jonathan now as a character, you've got Logan as a character, you've got myself, of course. And I do this conference at MIT Museum because we were making history. We were making, we were premiering our computer network that we personally call collective computing. You can call it AI, what have you, machine learning. And we present our work and there's a professor there named Jeremy Kepner. And this guy, I mean, he's the, he's been around the block. He's seen everything. He's about 50 years old. So he's seen so much about uh, technology and, com and supercomputers because that's, it's really blown up in the last 50 years. And he knew Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and all of those type of people. And so I do my presentation and he comes up to me at the end of it. And he says, that was like Steve Jobs in his prime, in his prime. And so I'm like blown back because he knew Steve Jobs. I'm like, whoa, okay. And so you have now Jeremy, Jonathan, Logan. Fast forward, now you get to March of 2020. So we're now saying, okay, let's move forward with Conduit. Let's really start working on drugs, on, on drug discovery, helping people. The pandemic happens. Hold, you know, Boston shuts down immediately. There's curfews. Everything's going wild. You know, you, someone coughs on the subway. Everyone's backing up 50 feet. Crazy stuff. You guys know, remember how it was. And thought the world was going to end, you know. And so um, Jonathan, he reaches out to me, says, Ryan, Now's your time to shine. Now show the world what Conduit can do. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, totally. <laughs> yeah, exactly, for sure. Yeah. And um, he's like, yeah, 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 try it, try it. And um, I said, all right, I'll try it. You know, I'm, I'm down to try and, and, and work on this virus no one's ever seen before, you know, that's, that's, that it's mutating millions of times per day. Um, that's collapsing society. Sure, yeah. I mean, and you should have seen, I was, I was couch surfing with one of my, um, with one of my friends. I was like living on their couch. I was in Boston. And uh, so I was like, yeah. So he's like, take on this wild virus. I mean, it's slowly up here. And I was like basically down there. And um, I said, okay, well, let me look for a biologist first. Let me look for a biologist because I'm not a biologist. Many, many things, you know, quantum engineer, this and that, but not a biologist. The only science field I actually did not like at MIT. And so I looked through this directory at ICP, Intelligent Crazy People. And only one name comes up when I look up biologists. One name from comes up, Logan, Logan Thrasher Collins. I'm like, that's crazy. And so we reach, I reach out to him, say, hey, Logan, um, you know, do you want to work with me on this, uh, finding a treatment for COVID? And he's, yeah, sure. And so I prepared for him this dossier of thousands of pages of research summarized in like a couple pages. And I presented to him. And so this is why it's going to get an expert, guys. So I presented to him. I say, take a few days. Let me know if we can do something from this research. Comes back to me to the next day. And he says, Ryan, I came up with an idea. I said, okay, great. And I said, did my research help at all? I said, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Not the thousands of pages of research that I spent. Not whatsoever. And he had come up with this whole new approach, again, to find treatments for uh, COVID-19 and future coronaviruses. And then Jeremy, the way he comes back in the story, is that he was then leading the this board at the White House that oversaw the supercomputer simulations, oversaw people using supercomputers alongside the White House to find a treatment for COVID. So long story short, um, Logan and I began working together um, and with the White House, um, based on Jeremy's recommendation, um, and other people as well uh, on the merit of what we're doing to do this project. And so it was, again, it was, it was me and Logan basically starting off these two, three guys in their 20s, just graduated from college, working alongside, again, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. And it was amazing. It was, it was so crazy. And we were able to bring in a lot of people. I mean, this wasn't just kind of your typical, this was your typical millennial movie, your kind of 21st century movie where you had people of every color. You had first people from India, Egypt, St. Louis, Miami, you know, wherever, um, all over the world, professors and everything. So again, we had it where Logan and I were basically working, especially Logan working, he was still getting his PhD, working his PhD, just got his, his bachelor's in biology, leading this team of professors um, on, again, a virus that had, well, had never seen before. And we did it. You know, we did it. We worked really hard. He worked really hard. And then after two years, you know, we were able to publish the research. And so it's been an awesome story. So, and is it that how Nanosplash was born or is it something else? So that was, so the next chapter of that is, is we had a discussion. This was in, I want to say late 2020. Um, and we said, okay, do we want to monetize off of, I had, I had a, a sort of discussion. I, I, I encouraged a discussion at Condor. I said, we're working on this treatment. We're working on a way to create treatments. Um, do we want to monetize off that? And keep in mind for us, I mean, we're, we're, 
hugely inspired by like Jonas Salk, who created the polio vaccine, did not patent it, said I give it to the world. Um, our job is to be good ancestors, is what he said. Also inspired by Jimmy Wales, the founder of Wikipedia, and other people like that, Tesla, um, who want to give free electricity to the world. And so I said, okay, well, we all agree, say, hey, we don't want to monetize off this. We don't want anyone to die because they can't afford somehow, some way what we're doing here. So, okay, well, how can we as a company do something that also helps people, but also sustains us as well at the same time? And so for me, especially being in California, there's a few different things with being in California. And I always remember this thing about California that you might hear in, from sort of business perspective is, is that the people that made the most money um, in California in the gold rush uh, in the 1800s were not the miners because it wasn't actually that much gold there, relatively speaking. It was the people that sold the pants, that sold the pants. And so you have that going on. And two is going back to uh, conduit. Our ultimate vision was to use computers to do things that are physical, use computers to do things that are physical. And so I saw this a huge opportunity for us to transition over into the physical, handheld, handmade space, uh, making physical products and using, again, quantum physics, quantum engineering, quantum mechanics, et cetera, using what I do as well. And so then with all that sort of in, in my mind, and I said, okay, well, let's do something that we would want to use. And so I say, we, I mean, the team, and the team is, is so diverse, as you might imagine, coming from Miami. We have Logan, who's a super scientist, myself, who's done a little bit of everything, business and, and done technology as well from Miami. Like I said, um, we have people who are moms that maybe didn't get their bachelor's. You have people that were from Asia, from China, people that are from Taiwan, people from, you know, all over there, maybe there some were consultants. So it's just really, it was a sort of, in a way, and be, we use ourselves as a focus group and say, okay, what would be a product we would want to use? And so I came up specifically with the idea of, hey, what if we had a bottle, a very simple bottle, very easy, small, spit into it, and the chemical inside changes colors and minutes to tell you if you have COVID or not. And that's where Nano Splash came out of. And ever since, it's been super exciting. That's that's so cool. And and so and how is it doing? So is it available? Can people buy it? Are you looking for approval? How is the approval process going? Oh, Which stage is that? Yeah, so it, it, it's great. It's exciting. Actually, let me let me see. Did I? There we go. So three, two, one, boom. Oh, look at this beauty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's it took a lot of hard work. Um wow. so we're looking at Patented right now, um, so it's amazing. And you just, you know, you just unscrew it, guys. It's really simple. You just unscrew it, and what you do. So it's actually quantum dot technology. Like Ryan, what does this quantum have to do with anything? Uh, like my grandma asked. And so it's it's really simple, actually. You just spit into this part of it mm -hmm. on the camera. There we go. And there's a tube down here that changes. That there's a chemical inside that changes colors to tell you if you have COVID or not. How, and, how long uh, does it take? It takes about 30 minutes, about 30 minutes. And um, yeah, so nothing put up your nose or anything like that. So again, we, we pass. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you know, I'm going through that right now. Like right now, my whole, like my, my dog, my baby, my daughter, my husband, everybody has COVID. I'm for now and the only know that I'm okay. And it's such a pain to do those exams with, with like my three-year-old daughter just having to swab her nose. It's like, it's insane. It's insane. I wish I had that, you know, just so she would just, listen, honey, just spit here and we will know, you know, it would be so much easier. Yeah. Yeah. And so, and how far, how, how is this, the, the approval process going and, and, and how is it like you're, you're kind of finding a big industry there somehow, right? So how, how is this, is there anything you could share in this direction? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. There's a little, there's a little bit I can share. So in terms of our development, like I said, we got our patent for it. We're actually patent pending across the world too. Um, so we're, we're thinking about all the countries here. Um, so there's that going on. We're also partnering with a lab in, in Boston. That's why I'm in Boston right now called Boss Lab, B-O-S Lab. And um, so we're working with them. And we have some scientists. Now, of course, we have scientists working with us from all over, as you might imagine, Harvard and sort of the local area, MIT, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're doing our testing now. So basically the way I explain it is we're at the patent level of testing. We've done patent level testing. And now we're getting towards the EUA uh, level testing. So for those who don't know what EUA is, it's emergency use authorization approval. So it's basically the thing that allowed for the vaccines to be used uh, very, relatively quickly, et cetera. And so we're basically preparing for that now. Um, and some people actually are like, I'm Maria basically spoke to it, but actually it, it's actually COVID is, bring, is having a resurgence. Uh, speaking market wise, the market is, is, is actually growing. A lot of sort of people who are not familiar with the space 
don't really know this, but the cases are still going up, even if you have a, a vac if at least the first shot of the va a vaccine. Um, I can speak to that. And two is is that oh here here in Brazil is going up like crazy all over. Oh again. yeah yeah yeah, and, it, and you know, and, and that's something that again Logan and I knew. Basically, the whole honestly, the whole scientific community really knew. And there are there are even plans. I mean, as, as we all kind of know, plans to 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 work with um, to treat pandemics. You know, because we had the other stuff like that before, um, but those plans were not followed, at least in America. Um, and so, our thing, our challenge here in America is that we don't really have a clear vision of like what the post-pandemic world even looks like. What okay, what numbers we need to hit, etc. So it's been kind of like a bit of a fumbling of the ball. I feel like overall. Um, but you know, so you, it, it really, I guess, on the private side of being a, are using our innovation to to to, to speak to that and say, hey, here's what the world's going to look like, and here's the, your passport to normal again. You know, you don't have to be scared or fearful. Fortunately, the, the fatality rate, the death rate of it, has dramatically fallen, which is great. But the challenge is that the, right now, that's because we've already so much, been, so much of us have been already been exposed to it. So we have what's called herd immunity, which is great sort of but the problem is that again this thing mutates so fast if you guys uh, at home is it, ne it never ends i mean we you know before the cold war there was the war between viruses and hosts you know um to give you guys an idea if say a mosquito bites you and it has malaria then that one virus one two viruses in three days three days just three days will populate and grow so much in your body then in three days, you will have more viruses of this malaria virus than all the stars in the Milky Way galaxy combined. Combined. Um, it's crazy. It's crazy. And so think that for, that's one person, right? So part of the what's going on globally, and it's actually part of it's due to, to climate change, but the, the risk for these type of pandemics like March 2020 is actually going up. It's going up and up. And so our, our, the problem institutionally is that it requires international collaboration, which can be a bit challenging for people that, you know, different countries and they, some are, some are trying to keep their wealth, some are trying to isolate people that are, you know, of lower economic status, even on a country level, um, you know, access to vaccines, whatever it is. I mean, there's, there's humans, we have to get our stuff together, basically, keep it simple. Um, and two is that we have to really raise a level of global health, global public health. Um, and so, for instance, a lot of the um, worst cases have been in people that have diabetes and have diabetes. Um, and so improving things like that, where there's more treatments for diabetes, we can cure diabetes. I actually know I have a friend at Harvard right now that's working on a cure for diabetes. Um, that would really stuff like that would help. And of course, really speaks to the, the global inequality in the world. Um, and so that's really what we're trying to help. So with this nano splash is really a passport to no normal where, hey, if your country that's and that's just the beginning right for covid yeah, there's still a lot to explore oh man for there's so much many other diseases that's the cool yeah. thing about this is that and that's why we worked on it again us scientists we, we you know we know what's going on and we said okay well, there's gonna be other variants obviously like i said you know three days da, 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 da. and i said okay we got to make something that adapts to new variants number one and not only that other diseases other diseases um this the, covid was just the one that happened to hit there's going to be other diseases or viruses that have this risk of really blowing up in a huge way. Um, one virus looking at now, that's a bit more established, a bit more well-known already is HIV, looking at uh, adapting nanosplast to HIV. Um, and so basically just really just helping people. And again, our, our really our, our, we see our core audience as moms and women. Um, you know, we all of us have a mom um, and some of these biologically. And with that, it said, you know, moms, as many women know, make most of the decisions in the household. You know, I have friends that are millionaires and I and it's like, yeah, I don't make any decisions in the house. <laughs> My wife makes all the decisions, you know, and so statistically women make about about 80, 85 percent of decisions in terms of buying goods for the house, whether it be food, et cetera, preparing the kids lunch, whatever it may be. And not just have to be our mom, of course, but our mother like figures, you know, people there for us. Um, and so that's really who we're trying to help at the core of it, because we feel like if we can help moms, you know, and we can help women, then you're really helping the whole world. So that's where we're going with it. That's really amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, we are all cheering for you here, Thank Ryan. You. I still have a couple of questions for you, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, it's it's outside, you know, the, the Nanosplash and, and, and Columbia's universe more really um, a question that we usually ask ourselves here at Future Hacker. Uh, because we've been talking a lot regarding, you know, the power of quantum computer and, and this, and quite like it, it's going to open a whole 
universe of discoveries and possibilities just the with the ability of being able to crunch and make sense of so many data in, in such a different speed right so but it also opens the door for many risks like for example when talking about cybersecurity right so do you feel we'll be able to to combat those threats like on the same speed as they are created like because my understanding is that we should be doing something now in order to be prepared for the future and it ju and it just seems that the cyber risks that we currently have without all this power involved we are already lagging behind what's your thought about that yeah absolutely i mean you're absolutely right uh first of all is is that i say unfortunately but it's it it's technically depends on your your perspective on it but i say unfortunately that a lot of the funding for quantum a lot of the uh, focus on quantum has been like what maria just said on exploiting cracks in our in our security and so there's basically a, a, a what i call a new cold war honestly the new cold war is quantum um because you know it's it's one thing to have weapons right but every everyone knows i mean going back to sun Tzu and the art of war it's all about information and being able to get get the information of your opponents and and so that's really what these governments are trying to do in this sort of human versus human when you know in contrast like we were just talking about COVID is a more animal versus virus, host versus virus type thing. So we really need to unify, but speaking back to Maria's point, is we, she's absolutely right. We do need to make efforts to combat that. Technically, there are some efforts, of course, they're, they're not nearly as well funded. Um, there's one, I think it's called Quantum Ledger. It's, it's more of a blockchain approach to making a sort of quantum resistant blockchain, um, which is awesome. But it, my, then my point is, like, well, blockchain is awesome, but a lot of, it's used for secure hash algorithms when It could also be used, again, going back to the conduit in our first, uh, our foundation, it can be used for really important things like finding drugs for new medications, etc. It's, it's actually the world's biggest computer network, uh, Bitcoin, I mean, by far, by far. And, but it's also one of the world's biggest polluters. Um, and so going back to Maria's point about, you know, these cybersecurity risks is that there, there's a huge need for people to create this quantum landscape of what the quantum vision is going to look like, not just in sort of a tit for tat, you know, Cold War relived over again, but also how can we protect ourselves as well? There's not so much of that. There is a huge opportunity for that. Um, so what you're going to see over the next 10, 20 years, definitely 20 years, is you're going to see these dr more dramatic, think kind of what you saw with like, you see with like a uh, blockchain where it's like this blockchain exchange got hacked and they lost 50 billion, da, da, da. you're going to see stuff like that. But now instead of being more so they got the guy's password, it's going to be they cracked it even manually, even brute force wise using quantum computers. Um, and so the Shor's algorithm actually I had going back to MIT, Peter Shor actually presented to my class at MIT about the Shor's algorithm, how it works and how it can crack RSA encryption. And that was kind of one of the moments. Um, I mean, it's a beautiful algorithm, but that's one of the moments uh, is that for me, I said, okay, well, how can we use this this quantum stuff for good um you know like basically like maria saying i mean it's it's it, we, humans you know we, we, we history repeats itself so often in just kind of different scenes different landscapes different costumes different fashion different time period different years but it's kind of the same basic story is like for instance i think about um the manhattan project you know so we discovered atomic physics subatomic physics and atoms and quantum and the kind of the first major thing we did with it was make a bomb You know, and, and I look at that and, and going back to MIT, a lot of MIT people worked on that project. And it's a different time. I, I'm not trying to judge them. But I will say is that, you know, there was a time period in this uh, documentary. It was called it's called um, the class was called History of Physics taught by David Kaiser at MIT. Very famous uh, MIT historian, science historian, physics historian. And they interviewed these people um, that had worked on the, the Manhattan Project. And they said, well, The controversy was, well, well hold on, you, you guys are, all, United States was already beating Japan. We were already beating Germany. What was the, you know, why? Why would you keep working on it when we're winning already? You know, FDR and them, they already knew that they were, we were going to win um, well into like 1943. Hence why they have all these conferences talking about the post-World uh, War II era. And they knew that. They just, they knew that. And, and so, but they kept, these scientists kept working on it. They said, well, because we're already working on it. You know, there wasn't really an impetus to, to, There wasn't really a motive anymore. It's just because it was, it was already emotion. There was sort of an inertia that they, no one really bothered to um, change. And then after that, what happens? You have Oppenheimer, who then actually gets totally humiliated um, pro professionally by Senate and and by and otherwise because he's telling America, "Hey, listen, we don't need bigger bombs. We don't need a hydrogen bomb." 
You know, we don't need new technology to, to hurt people in bigger and more powerful ways. We don't need to make things that are going to destroy the world a thousand times over. And they totally shunned him, got him out of government, took away all his credentials, everything. Um, this guy that led the project. So, you know, I think it's really going to be important, honestly, um, in this next era. There's a quote by, by JFK that I really love. It says, we have guided missiles, but misguided men. Guided, misguided men. I think it's important to, in that, using that, that phrasing, to have leadership that, like Maria saying, really articulates a vision for a secure future for all of us, not just on a military level, but on a human level, on a financial level, on a privacy level, um, number one. But two, going back to that quote, we have misguided, uh, we have guided missiles with misguided men. We also got to include women and people of color, you know, people of all countries into these conversations and say, hey, I have a voice too, and I want to be heard in this, this future um, that we're creating together because so many times these conversations are so limited to a certain certain demographic um, of people and 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 that's what I think kind of we, we speak uh, towards that we say hey well, we're going to include people of color and women we'd like half our team are, are women and most of my advisors and mentors in life have been women and so I think if we have more women on, the, on talking and speaking in these positions you're really going to get a lot better world honestly and and still on that page uh, Ryan. Um... I think you, you quoted for me, like uh, reimagining the society through quantum computing right. and healthcare was just the, is just the beginning for you, right? So which other visions do you have when it comes on, on building a better future and a more inclusive future? And how do you see quantum computing playing that uh, role for healthcare that's clear, but for other sectors? Yeah, absolutely. So speaking to healthcare, just a quick example for those who aren't super familiar is that even now I constantly are reading, I'm reading posts and articles about how you can use quantum computing uh, to actually predict um, uh, Alzheimer's early on. Um, you know, we actually, we actually did a paper on uh, Pranav Karan about how you can use quantum machine learning algorithms to predict future COVID-19 outbreaks. Um, and so obviously extending beyond that in terms of uh, potentially a potentiality of how we can use quantum computing to, to really make the world a better place. I mean, one of that is just really, so one on the research side is the most obvious part. Um, so researchers will have so many more tools. So for instance, I'll give you an example going back. Um, this is technically healthcare, but I'm gonna leave healthcare in a second, I'm sorry. Is that um, we're one of the scientists I just talked to, like I said, one of my friends working on a, a cure for diabetes, not a treatment, but a cure. Um, says, well, hey, I've got all this data. I would, I had some more quantum. I said, she said, I would love to use a quantum computer. That would allow me to move so much. I mean, I'm, just, I'm not talking about like, 10 years to nine years, I'm talking about 10 years to like one year, two years, you know, in terms of really date, data processing, all this type of stuff. So I say, and I remember I bring that up just because that would have obviously direct, direct influence and impact on, on the world. But extending beyond healthcare, there's even, I mean, it's, it goes really, really, really Star Trek-y. There's uh, even quantum transportation, or teleportation, quantum teleportation. Um, and so the, the people who just won the Nobel Prize, uh, for those who aren't familiar, they, they won it because they proved that quantum teleportation uh, is a thing, you know, and that's something. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> if someday you could find someone to talk about that here, it would be just amazing because yeah. I can't even picture that. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's wild. It's wild. Um, and it's funny, I was actually talking about that like 10 years ago. You should have seen it. It's been really crazy, Maria. Like, I'll talk about these things and be like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I know what happened. You know, I was talking about Bitcoin back in 2014. What? What is that? You know, so um, so you have you have you know quantum teleportation. So the sort of Star Trek, beam me up, Scotty. You have that going on. Um, you know, then you have also even creating um, new. This is going to sound kind of weird, but new universes. This is really really far out, but this is like right, creating new universes. So there's my professor, my advisor, Seth Lloyd at MIT. He has a book. It's called Programming the Universe programming the universe and so long story short saving you like 200 pages of material is that quantum computers are like the universe or rather the universe is a quantum computer that's computing itself computing itself and so the power of a quantum computer the, the real beauty of it like you can call it a quantum computer but i when i'm talking more so philosophically and and, and, and deep level it's really a multiverse computer it's really a multiverse computer it's a computer that exist at the intersection of all these different keep it simple parallel universes and we're trying to extract the, the the universe that gives us the result that we want that gives us the result we want so there's actually a quantum company called multiverse computing to give you an idea and i can break that down a little bit more later if you want and so 
Well, with these quantum computers, with that, you can actually create, so say you have a quantum computer that's really powerful, say 250 qubits, you can create a, a, a mini reality, a mini, 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 mini reality. So even example might be gaming where, you know, you might hear, you know, is life a simulation? Is it, is it, all, is it all a game? You could, you know, theoretically create a, a whole nother mini universe. Um, so think gaming, think even shopping, you know, you could shop in this universe and then come back. You could live a lifetime in that universe and come back and have the knowledge of that in your head. That's a little bit more far out, but it is very much so doable. Um, so really, really powerful. Um, and the last thing I'll say before I stop talking is that, um, is, I know I'm saying a lot, there's also um, quantum internet too. So you can now have ultimate security. And that's that's a little bit they're trying to kind of do in response, like Maria was saying to the, the quantum uh, cracking of codes, but it's a slightly different idea. It's an infrastructure idea. So Shor's algorithm was is more of a out algorithm. It's more software. And then quantum internet is really an infrastructure but basically, Maria and I can can speak, say we're on a phone, we say we're using a quantum internet, and assuming there's no sort of trackers in the room, there's no recording devices in the room, we can know by a physical, physical fact that no one has intercepted our communication, our communication. Um, they would have to break the laws of quantum physics. They'd have to discover something. So this is different from Shor's algorithm, guys. Shor's algorithm is for breaking codes. This is a physical infrastructure idea. So codes being passwords. This, what I'm talking about Maria, is the physical infrastructure. So Maria can physically determine that no one has physically gone in and sort of touched or listened in on our on our conversation. So that's called the quantum internet. Um, so yeah, so that should be enough for you to chew on, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> it was so amazing talking to you, Ryan. And, and you know, it, it's just like uh, each answer that you give us is just a whole new world for us to, to go learn about it, understand more, research about it. And that's what we most like doing here for Future Hacker is just opening people's minds to what's new and what's different out there so people can just go their own digging. And, right. you know, if anyone is interested in finding you, to knowing more about your projects or taking part, so how to find you? Yeah, absolutely. So um, very simple, guys. Conduitcomputing.com, C-O-N. Thank you. We will write it down here, content, so people can find it as well. Let me mark it here. Such a pleasure, and it's so amazing to have you on Future Hackers Network as well. Uh, welcome to the network. Thank you for being here with us, Ryan. Bye bye, everybody. Future Hacker Life Path Future.